Well, hello there, beautiful people of the internet. This is Brandon with Crypto Trades and Tech, and today I want to discuss what is the Bitcoin hash rate, and how important is it to price, and is it a predictor or a tr lagging trailing indicator of price? As you see, I've got pulled up here the total hash rate of the Bitcoin network on blockchain.com. You can see that we are lower now than we have been any time in the past year. Uh, this is measured in uh, terahash per second, which is a really big number. means a lot of computational power. Uh, the Bitcoin network is far more powerful as far as computational power than any of uh, the supercomputers in the world. Uh, but you can see we've had a deep decline in hash power because of China's action against miners. Now, a lot of people are wondering, is this a problem for the network? Is this going to uh, crash the network or is the network now vulnerable? Uh, let's discuss a little bit about that uh, and I'll give you my conclusions at the end, but uh, I wanted to start with a discussion of the tech just to make sure we all level set uh, and jump to the second half of this video if you want uh, the, the technical analysis and price analysis uh, part of this. But for now, let's look at the technology. So a while back, I did a video, a full walkthrough of the Bitcoin white paper, and we detailed exactly how a lot of this works. So for more information, I'll put a link to that video in this uh, in the description below. But you can take a look at my full one hour Bitcoin white paper walkthrough to get a lot more detail about how all this works. But basically, with the blockchain, the blocks, as if you're not aware, the way Bitcoin works is whenever you try to transfer funds from your wallet to another wallet address, you're submitting that to a public ledger. And those are secured in blocks. So all of the transactions for a certain period of time are combined into a block. And as a miner figures out the uh, hash that is needed to be found to secure that block, that miner is the one that will then sign that block cryptographically and then the network will move on to the next block. So that's what we're going to describe is what is this hashing function? And you can kind of see here in this diagram I've got pulled up, you can see these, um, at, at this, this diagram at the top right over here, we have trans, uh, TX0, TX1, those are, are transfers. So those are transfers from one wallet to another wallet. You sign those as a hash and you roll those up into a, a root. So basically, you take all of the transactions that are waiting to be confirmed in the next block. That sits in something called the mempool. So the mempool is just a place that uh, all of the miners store the transactions that are waiting to be processed. And what they do is they organize those potential transactions in a tree. And at the root of that tree is a hash. And what they are trying to do is they're trying to find a combination of that hash plus this number called the nonce and how they've organized that tree. And they're trying to generate a certain result in the resulting hash. So that's what's going on. That's what they're trying to find. It takes many, many variations of, of working with that tree and the uh, nonce value to be able to, to be able to create the necessary hash so uh, to illustrate that let's go over here to this hash calculator and i want to show you how a hash works now if i type in the word test what a hash is is it's a mathematic uh function that basically turns this data value into a hash now you, you can see here the hash is much larger than the data value but i can put a large number of data in here and then the data would be much longer than the hash. And the hash is a shorter um, result of all this data. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to modify some data here. And so you can see when I calculate the hash, my current hash value is D33, so forth and so on, ends in BF. Now if I change any variable in the data that we're using to generate this hash, so I add the letter A here, it's going to completely change the hash value. Now, what the Bitcoin network is trying to do, basically the miners are going through and they're trying to find a combination of all, say, pretend these are the transactions. And then this other part right here is something called the nonce. And so what they're going to do is they're going to try to go through every possible combination of the nonce. Uh, so uh, this, this additional bit that we add on here, I'm going to separate it just so you can kind of see so there's a space in here now. So I'm going to try to go through every combination of the nonce until I find a hash 
I'm going to try to organize the, these are the, all the transactions in the block, and this is that nonce value. And I'm trying to organize them in such a way that I get a zero at the beginning. So I got to keep trying this because in hexadecimal, there are 14 characters. It goes from zero to nine, A, B, C, D, E, and F. Okay. So let's see here. If I go D, uh, let's just keep trying letters here until I find uh, one that has a leading zero. It's going to take me a while. So you see, this is what the miners are doing, but it's incredibly, incredibly fast. They're doing this. There you go. I finally found a zero. So as you can see there, I tried, I had to go all the way through the letter K to be able to find a hash that started with just one zero. Now what the Bitcoin miners are having to do, that's not nearly enough for them. They need to find several leading zeros. And every subsequent zero is exponentially harder than the, than the prior. It takes exponentially more times of trying this combination of all the transactions that are waiting to be validated plus this nonce value. And, it's, and it's, it has to ro rotate through all of the possible nonce values, which there are 4 billion of them. And if none of those 4 billion work, it has to reorder these transactions in the tree, reorder, reor reorganize the tree, and then try all 4 billion again. So miners around the world are constantly doing this. They're organizing all the transactions in a tree and they're turning through the 4 billion possible nonce combinations. If none of those works to pr produce a, sh a hash that has enough zeros at the beginning, then it has to reorganize the tree and start all over again. So that's what's hap happening technically. Now, as far as the Bitcoin network, how does this secure the network? Well, this secures the network because this is a brute force method of security. So in order for you to overtake the network, you have to have the ability to find this combination of the transaction tree and this nonce value faster than the network in total. So you have to have more computing power in the entire Bitcoin network. So this goes back to the question of, is are the values that we're at today are we at risk of somebody attacking the Bitcoin network? Well, the risk does possibly uh, stand that if China is actually not kicking out the miners, they've actually force majeure taking over those miners operations. There's a small chance that they've actually done that. And the reports of all these miners that are shipping uh, mining gear to other countries um, is, is inaccurate. And that's all a state propaganda lie. And the Chinese are actually stealing all these miners. And they're going to put them in a couple of facilities and light it all up and attack the Bitcoin network. That is a possibility. There's a risk, but it wouldn't take long before the Bitcoin network would rally around and kick those miners off the network. So it's not a long term risk. And if you want to see more, there's a video that uh, Andreas Antonopoulos did about uh, really if a state actor tried to do something like this and it didn't work. So say it temporarily affected the Bitcoin network. And then the developer community had to rally together to kick them off the network. And then Bitcoin continued to operate. Uh, really, all that would do is make the case for Bitcoin that much stronger. So they would be risking doing all this uh, effort to try to uh, capture all of this mining equipment to attack the network just to possibly prove its case and make it stronger. So if you look at history, though, if you think about all those miners that have been shut down in China, we were at 180 almost 180 uh, uh, terahash per second, or yeah, see here, 180. It's actually exahash is the total. So we're at 180 here, 180 million, I believe. And now we're down a little bit, almost half of that, not quite, but right around half of that. So in theory, almost 51% of the network is now offline. And so if all of these miners that, are, that were online are now used to then attack the network, that would be a risk that we have to keep an eye out for. And most likely what's happening is that these miners are on boats or in crates and they're not really available for use to attack the network right now. They're just offline. So we'll want to watch and see does when this number starts to rebound um, and, and try to uh, triangulate the source of that. Now I'm working on a project right now to try to identify all the miners that have moved to Texas. Um, I think this will help us to start to triangulate. Texas seems like maybe a new nexus of crypto mining, which would probably be a little bit uh, safer place than, than China, possibly, given that Texas has, uh, has some very favorable regulation toward crypto mining currently anyway. Now, a lot of people say that the hash rate of the network is a leading indicator of price. I've found it to be the other way around. I've typically found that 
Um, sometimes the hash rate does go ahead of price as uh, price is moving, but it's really driven by sentiment. From what I can tell is when Bitcoin's price is trending up, the hash rate tends to trend up fairly strongly and sometimes a little bit ahead of it. But what you'll see is that the change in the trajectory of, of price happens first and then the miners start to uh, mining starts to pick up. So I, I think it's actually a trailing indicator that looks at time like it, like it might be leading because the hash rate will spike ahead of a, a, a price spike of Bitcoin. But I think that's more of a dynamic of it. it actually was trailing a little bit and the spike that you are seeing ahead of a supposed spike in price is often actually uh, a couple of months behind some sort of uh, breakout in Bitcoin's price prior. Now clearly in this case, um, Bitcoin's price and the hash rate have gone fairly well side by side, except now we see price is starting to put in a bottom, but the hash rate continues to drop as the rest of the miners are, are being uh, forced to leave China. Now, as long as we continue to see news about these miners actually relocating and we get firsthand accounts of people who were mining in China that have, you know, demonstrated that they are actually loading up, putting these things in crates and shipping them elsewhere. Once we get more and more firsthand reports of the receiving of those shipments to uh, different countries, Kazakhstan, I know, received some. The U.S. has received some for, for sure. If we get confirmation that a, a large number of these miners have landed uh, overseas, that's going to mean that the, the Chinese government at least hasn't facil hasn't confiscated enough of the mining power to uh, orchestrate a 51% attack at that point. And at some point, it'll become clear that they haven't confiscated any of them. I don't think they're confiscating any of the mining equipment from what I can tell, but I also can't prove that. Now, back to what a lot of you are probably here for. Uh, the, the price action, what's going on here? Here's what I see with Bitcoin's price action. I see a bottoming pattern and I see really strong support at 30,000. I think the market is kind of showing us that we have a bottom support here right around 30,000. If I were to draw this down to those, you see these daily closes right here, the daily close. We've never closed a, on a daily basis below 31,500 roughly. So I think that's the market telling us that we're putting in a floor right around 30,000. 500. And you can see a nice uh, rebound here. We have two trend lines we've been watching. This one here, I'm going to make them both purple so that you can see those are key trend lines. Okay. Those are two key trend lines we've been watching. This one here from this this uh, high of 41,000 and then into the peak low. Now, price got a really strong rebound when it, uh, this was, I believe, capitulation. I felt like this was capitulation the day it was all happening. We came into the 2021 open price, which I did not recognize immediately it was heath that called this out on one of my live streams for me that that's what we hit was the 2021 open price and we've had a really strong rebound since then we've had a retest of a lower level right around right at 30,000 uh, psychological 30,000 dollar level and now we're breaking out to the upside so now since we've lost the 120 day sma i've personally been pretty light but seeing that we've been putting in a floor here at 30,000 i did go ahead and increase my long-term hold position right at 30, a little above $30,000 on these bounces above. Uh, so what we're really looking for here, this is the first sign of real solid repair. We're starting to repair now. I would be waiting for a retest of this support level at 35.5 as a really important level here for the last couple of weeks. If we get a breakout here and a retest of 35.5, it's probably worth adding a little bit coming into the support. In my opinion, this is not financial advice. This part of the video, uh, None of this is financial advice. If you end up taking this advice blindly, you'll probably lose all your money and be living in a van down by the river. But uh, so anyway, this is just educational. And it's my opinion. Uh, I'm going to be looking for entries as we come into this support level or possibly even this support level, come back into these trend lines potentially. And then what we'll be able to do is as, as price comes into those, we're really looking for resumption back off of it. And there's a chance that we could just break out here and go straight to our next key level of 40,600, which is the January daily close level. I wouldn't expect that. I would expect some some uh, retracement up, up to support levels here, but we'll find out. I just now noticed here last night while I was asleep, we came into this trend line here right before we were zooming up. That would have been a great place to add coming back into that trend line, the confluence of these couple of trend lines here. Uh, probably a really good opportunity to have added there coming into that support as well. But where do I really feel comfortable being much more aggressive with entries? I'm going to do another video on 
the basics. My next video will be on a very simple trading strategy. And what it's going to do is going to show people how to start with a uh, dollar cost averaging into Bitcoin when the when the price is, is at the right levels and then uh, shaving a little bit when when price is, is very elevated. A very simple strategy of starting with that. And the next step is to layer in a single moving average, the 120 day SMA. Now, this is a pretty good indicator when you're above the 120 day SMA. It's a pretty good indicator that Bitcoin might be heading for a really strong uptrend. And when you drop below it, oftentimes uh, we stay below it for an extended period of time. So I'll be really comfortable getting much more aggressive with trades and leverage trades when we get above the 120 day SMA, which is, interestingly enough is also our outer trend line that we've been watching. So this area right here is the most important area to me. That's uh, a 45,800 level on the horizontal level here and it coincides with these trend lines now it depends it's a matter of timing as to when we get into that i expect that we will probably be coming into that price range early july which makes which is, which would put us the 120 day sma and this trend line and that horizontal resistance level all around that same time sometime early next month if we do make it up there the key will be to break out of all of this when we break out of all of this and we get a solid resumption signal somewhere around fifty thousand dollars is when it'll be safe to be a little bit more aggressive on bitcoin as we're, we're much much more likely to have put in a floor and, and we're breaking out but for now careful uh, and thoughtful uh, dollar cost averaging into bitcoin while we are in still in these very very uh, low levels after the sell-off it's still a very good time to look at taking maybe an initial position or adding to your long-term hold position that's just my opinion none of this is financial advice i thank you all for watching the video if you made it this far i appreciate all the support uh, please like and subscribe you can follow me on twitter as well take care